the SAA YouTube. Um, so if anyone wants to kind of revisit something, um, they can do that, or you can also share it with colleagues uh, as you want to. Um, on that side where the video is going to be posted, you will then also have links to the slide decks. Uh, so we'll share that all with you um, in the next few weeks. And with this, I think we can go into the actual presentation. Thank you, Kirsten. So today we are going to have an introduction to the EAD, EAD encoded archive description for you with a lot of help. I'm Karin Bredenberg. Um, I'm the co-chair of TSEIS. With me, I have Kirsten Arnold, who is the EAD team lead in TSEIS. We also have Lee Janlin, who is a member of TSEIS. And here comes the huge Thank you from me for all the people aiding us with this session. Emi Shirakawa from Tohoku University. Isumi Hirano from Rikoyo University in Japan. We have Boyong Kim from the University of Tokyo and Nami Woon from the University of Tokyo Archives who will be aiding us with the Korean. So many thanks from us in TSAIS for the opportunity to be able to do this with the help of you. I'm going to the next slide. So TSEIS is the, we love acronyms in, in what we're working with. So TSEIS is the Technical Subcommittee on Encoded Archival Standards at the Society of American Archivists, SIA, PEW. Uh, you will hear a lot of acronyms, but those are the main ones for us. We have made a presentation about what TSEIS is available on YouTube already. Uh, it's from 2020, but it's still the same that is valid. So in short, we are the ones who take care of the formats you use for managing and sharing archival information. And we are relying on you as users to uh, do revisions and work with the specification, with the standards. And you are the reason why we do this. On the next slide, I will have the links and you will, as Carson said, you will have access to the slides. So you don't need to write down all these um, links, but we do have a website at the Society of American Archivists. We are available on GitHub and that's the main source for information when it comes to the schemas. EID is published at the Library of Congress and EIC at the Staatsbibliothek Berlin. If you want to contact us in when we are not to, doing a webinar like this, is through our, you can do that through our mailing list. You sign up at the Library of Congress for that one, and you will get emails with information like free instances about the webinars like this one. If you find something in, in the standards, you can report an issue with, through GitHub or through a form that we have on the web page. So all the ways of contacting us. Uh, looking at TSEIS, we have a membership of up to 25 people. It's an international combined with SIA members group. So it's the goal is to be 50-50. And when we look at the international members, we are mostly in Europe, but we also have South America, Africa, Asia, and Oceania. So we are spread around the world. So you can imagine the times for meetings for some people. Uh, we have also split up the work in different teams. So as you heard, what you will be hearing most of today is about the EAD team. Uh, we have a team for EACCPF and we have one for EACF, which is functions. We have a schema team who works with the schemas and the transformations of the tag libraries. And we have an outreach team who helps us with setting up webinars like this one. On the next slide, what we are <coughs> doing is taking care of the standards. And that means that we do revisions. Uh, throughout the year, it's usually minor revisions where we fix smaller things that needs to be fixed. You find out spelling error, we fix, we will fix that. And that is happening around the year, but not all the time. 
we do that uh, on a cycle. On the next slide, we have the major revisions. Every fifth year, we need to following our, uh, the group that is above us in SIA being the standards committee, they have regulations that say that every fifth year, you need to restart and look at, do the standard need updates or not? And then do the work or not? So that's happening all the time. I think Kirsten will touch in upon the revision that's currently ongoing, but Kirsten, I'm leaving the floor to you. I'm going to mute, but I'm going to let you see me. Um, so go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this introduction, Karin. Um, as Karin mentioned, um, there is currently a major revision ongoing for EAD. However, in order to not overcomplicate things, we will concentrate today on the current version of EAD, which is EAD3. Um, but of course, if anyone is interested, uh, we can use the Q&A session at the very end to maybe kind of give a few pieces of information with regard to what might be changing in the new version. Um, what I wanted to start with is just kind of setting a little bit of a scene and giving a background and a kind of bird's eye view on standardization uh, of archival description. If we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, and that actually starts with a little bit of a detour on the topic of interoperability. Um, and the question that I've used here is one that uh, we use in the European Union, um, that the European Interoperability Framework, EIF, um, and they have defined interoperability in the way that you see here on the slides. Uh, there are different ways to define interoperability. There are different ways variations of interoperability, but essentially uh, the main points are the ones that are highlighted here. Um, interoperability is always driven by mutually beneficial goals for everyone who is working towards interoperability. Um, and it focuses on sharing information and knowledge. Um, and of course, in internet terms or in technical terms, that also means exchange of data. We can go to the next slide, please. Why is it important to talk about interoperability when you talk about standards? Um, the reason why we do this is because essentially all the standards that we are using have, among others, the goal of creating mm -hmm. interoperability. So interoperability in our context uh, mainly looks at the point of two or more systems being able to communicate with each other. And in order to do that, we need to have common data formats and XML, the extensible markup language is one of those data formats that you could use. Uh, and I'm mentioning this specifically because EAD as a standard is an XML standard. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. They also need to use common communication protocols for the actual exchange of the data. So that might be SQL, the structured query language, or it might be something like OAI PMH, the Open Archives Initiative Protocol for metadata harvesting. Does this mean that they always and in all aspects understand each other, these different systems? So if we go to the next slide, please. That includes the answer that is to a certain extent. Next slide. So in terms of exchanging data, there also needs to be an agreed understanding of each other's organizational context because the processes, the workflows, the guidelines that are used in each of these systems that are communicating with each other also need to be understood so that the systems actually can make sense out of the data that they exchange. There might also be a shared objective or goal and that needs to be agreed on. So for example, the goal might be enabling access to archival descriptions for a broad public audience. 
And there might be specific aspects of the archival description that you might want to highlight in that. So for example, if you are specifically looking into creating a map-based user interface, then this will require you to focus on other types of data in your data exchange than if you wanted, for example, to create a timeline. And then there needs to be um, certain principles applied. Um, and those principles um, are kind of the usual ones that you would find generally in the engagement in the internet. So it's openness, um, and that not only includes the open data, but also uh, ideally an open source development and open specification and standards. Um, there is the principle of reusability, um, again, not only concentrating on the data, but also on the IT solution. So that's something that has been created in one context can in theory be applied to another context. And then of course, data portability. So making it as easy as possible to export and import data from one system into the other. And again, with all these kind of agreements that have been made and kind of um, shared objectives and shared principles, there is this question of, does this mean that both of these systems or all of these systems involved in interoperability have to do exactly the same thing? And if we go to the next slide, you can see the answer to that is again, not in each and every detail. Um, and when we start looking at EAD, we will see what that actually means. If you go to the next slide, please. So in general, we would say standards enable and support interoperability, and they can do that in different ways and to a different extent. So they can really make things equal on both sides of the data exchange or they can mainly support kind of the understanding part. So the semantic um, interoperability between two systems. If you go to the next slide, please. Looking at the standards, I want to start with just a quick recap of what you might be more used to um, compared to EAD. And that is the standards that the International Council on Archives has been developing since the early 1990s. The ICA had different expert groups working on these and essentially throughout the early 2000s, um, essentially the first decade of the 2000s, four related but independent standards were the results of those expert groups work. The probably most prominent one is the General International Standard Archival Protection or IZG. Uh, which is the standard for describing archival materials. But there also are the International Standard Archival Authority Record for Corporate Bodies, Persons and Families, ESA CPF, which is to describe organizations, persons or families, mostly as the records creators. There is the International Standard for Describing Functions, so describing the functions that those records creators um, have fulfilled and where the result of those functions is the archival records. And then the international standard for describing institutions with archival holdings or ISTAYA, um, which essentially looks specifically at contact details for archival institutions or the services that archival institutions provide to their audience. Next slide, please. So this is just kind of a visual interpretation of what I just said. So kind of giving you the idea of the different pieces of um, entities, what it's called often in, in data modeling that are described by those standards. So ISAG describes the records, ESA CPF describes persons, families, and organizations, same as ISDIA describes organizations, and then ESDF is describing functions. If you go to the next slide, please. The purpose of these ICA description standards was to provide general guidance for preparing those different types of archival descriptions. And the idea was to provide this basis as either 
um, a complement to existing national standards or as a basis to create new national standards. So the main point of these ICA standards was to support consistency of archival descriptions internationally and thereby enable ease of retrieval based on the different aspects of archival description. Next slide, please. Coming back to what we talked about in the beginning, the extended objective of this essentially is interoperability. So enabling the exchange of these consistent and easy to retrieve archival descriptions. And that might be just for internal purposes. So for example, if you want to exchange information between your archival description system and the system that you might be using for digital preservation, but also for external purposes. So for the publication of archival finding aids on your own website uh, or for the creation of a web-based archival catalog. Um, and then as, as a further extension of that, sharing your archival descriptions in a bigger context. So that might be between different departments of the same institution, or it might be via an aggregation service for archival description where information from different organizations is put together in one place, or it might also be in the context of a cross-domain aggregation service. So where you are not only sharing data from archives, but also data, for example, from libraries or from museums um, who might kind of have a similar, but not the same approach to how they are being described. Next slide, please. So how does this look like in the day-to-day -day work? And the following slide only shows a few examples uh, of how this can look like. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, and just as a reminder, I wanted to kind of give a, a short review of the structure of ISAG. Uh, you might remember that there are seven areas of descriptive information. Uh, there's the identity statement, uh, which will to a certain extent be the focus of what we're going to talk about later on. Uh, but there also are contextual um, information that you can include. There is a possibility to describe the content in more detail. Um, there's a possibility to give conditions of access and use, to mention allied materials, and also to include some more internal notes and descriptive control information. Next slide, please. The identity statement will be the focus of the conversation later on, because essentially only the information that is in the identity statement of ISAG is labeled as essential. Um, and that basically um, covers five main aspects. That is the reference code. So some kind of identifier of the material that you are describing, a title, dates, usually the dates of creation, uh, a level of description so that you can tell your users whether you're describing a collection as a whole or if you're describing a specific item within a collection. And then a statement of extent. Uh, so that might be the um, area covered by the um, material, or it might be something like uh, storage information when we are talking about digital archival content. And then there's only one additional piece of essential information uh, from the context area, and that is the name of the creator. If you go to the next slide, please. The other thing that I wanted to mention, because we will see that also in EED, is the principle of a multi-level description. And that essentially means that the description kind of usually works its way from the general, so from the collection to the specific, to the single items. Um, depending on how the work is set up in your organization, you might actually also do it the other way around. So there are systems out there where you essentially start on the item level description, and then anything that is kind of shown for the collection level might be an aggregated information. So if you have single items described with their date of creation, then your system might just kind of create a bulk of that 
for the whole collection. There also is the principle that essentially information should only appear on the level of description where it is relevant. So that means that you can be more specific on a lower level uh, if that is applicable to your material. But it also means that you should avoid repeating information. So um, if we, for example, look at the uh, respect the form um, or at the, the provenance uh, principle that we have in archival description in many contexts, um, then mentioning the name of the records creator might only happen at the very highest level with the collection itself. But if that is the principle, how that collection has been created, you might not be repeating the name of the creator on each and level for each and every file and item in that collection. And then the last principle that also is in ISAG is kind of making the position of a specific unit of description in that hierarchy, in that multi-level description, explicit or as explicit as possible. Um, and we will see how EAD does this in a minute. Next slide, please. So these are just a few examples, and I hope um, you can at least guess uh, a little bit of what the details say on your screen. Uh, I apologize if this is too small, as Karen mentioned at the beginning. We will share this, the, the slides with you, uh, so you will be able to see that later on. Uh, in, in more detail. Um, this is just one example of a system that is called archive space. Uh, and just to kind of highlight uh, that under the basic information that archive space provides you with, you essentially have three of the six um, essential pieces of information from ISAG. You have the title, you have an identifier, and you have a level of description. Um, followed by dates and extent, so the two next essential pieces of information where you can expand that section a little bit and get some more detailed information in there. Um, and then uh, Archive Space also offers you to link to description of the records creator. So um, they have a separate model in archive space to describe the records creator, but then when you are describing archival material, they allow you to link to that description. Next slide, please. Another example how this could look like is the uh, software access to memory or Atom uh, as it's abbreviated. Um, and here you can actually even more directly see how this is based on ISAG because they have called the different sections that they have in their form according to the ISAG chapter. So here you can see the identity area, which equals the identity statement. Um, and you see that they have a reference code or identifier there. They have a title, they have dates, they have levels of description. They have information about the extent and medium. And then in the next section in the context area, they also have a possibility to link to description of a records creator, which you have created in a separate module. Next slide, please. And this last example here is just to show you that um, you might kind of find similar approaches also in non-system based ways to describe archival material. Um, and this is just an example um, using an Excel spreadsheet where essentially you might find those pieces of information from ISAG as the column headers. Or in this case, there also is a mix between um, ISAG pieces of information and specific elements that um, we will see when we look into uh, EAD. So for example, the third column, which is called unit ID, is the reference code in ISAG, and unit ID is the element that EAD uses for that. We go to the next slide, please. So going into the actual encoded archival standards, so the topic of today, uh, if we go to the next slide, um, I wanted to start also just with a quick overview. So 
uh, Karen already mentioned at the beginning, uh, the Society of American Archivists is kind of the, the next international body uh, to the ICA, uh, who is preparing and working with standards. And there is the Standards Committee of SAA, and then there are several technical subcommittees. Um, previously, there were two separate subcommittees, one on the encoded archival description on EAD, and one on the encoded archival context, ESC. And since 2016, they have been converged into what we currently have, the TSES that Karin presented earlier. Next slide, please. Essentially, what the encoded archival standards do is they offer you a representation of the ICA's description standard in a machine readable format. Uh, and Karin already mentioned uh, when she was talking about the sub teams of TSES that we currently have three related but independent standards um, that is ED and ESCCPF that are already mentioned and ESCF, which is currently being prepared for a draft publication during this year. And then there's actually a fourth standard, which is not maintained by TSES, but by the Archives Portal Europe Foundation, so my current employer, um, and that is the encoded archival guide, and that essentially covers the ISTIA, so the standard on the archival holding institutions. Next slide, please. So essentially you can create the same image that we saw earlier for the description standards, also for the encoded archival standards, where you have ED describing the record, ECCPF encoding information about persons, families, and organizations, EG also encoding information about specific types of organizations with archival holdings, and ECF encoding information about functions. Next slide, please. The purpose of these encoded archival standards is similar to the purpose that I mentioned earlier for the descriptive standards of ICA. So essentially what they provide you with is a consistent and structured way to encode archival descriptions. Um, thereby enabling the sharing and discoverability of machine readable information across systems. Um, so again, this can be within your own organization, but it can also be in a sharing um, environment. So essentially these standards provide you with building blocks, so to say, for collaborative collective resources. Um, so thereby not only allowing you to kind of do that in a structured and consistent way within your own organization, but also do it in a consistent way that others can more easily interpret and understand the data if you are sharing it with them. Next slide, please. And this is just a quick moment to see if there are any questions that anyone wanted to put into the chat. So far, I haven't seen anything, but if there's anything that anyone wanted to ask right now, um, we can just have a little breather. Otherwise, we'll do that at the very end. I think we can go to the next slide. And before looking at ED, I just wanted to include a few words on XML because um, with ED being an XML based standard, there will be a few things um, that I'm gonna use in my presentation, uh, which are general to XML and therefore might be good to understand at the beginning. We can go to the next slide, please. Uh, there are just kind of a few main elements in, in XML, and essentially those elements are elements and attributes. And often when you see uh, XML in writing, you will be able to identify elements by these kind of pointy brackets. And attributes, if you see it in a text, might be indicated by the at sign. 
Um, elements in general are the places where the actual content is. So they will have an opening tag uh, and they will have a closing tag. And in between those tags, you will have the actual content that is being encoded. While attributes essentially provide you an option to be more specific on that content or to identify different types of content or to normalize the content that is given within the element. And the example that you see at the bottom of the slide uh, kind of illustrates that with the example of a date. Um, so you can see in blue the date as the element, uh, so the opening tag and the end tag. You can see the written statement 21st of May 2024 as the content of the element. And yet, then you have, in this case, a normalizing attribute where you can see the date information in a standardized format. Um, in this case, it's following the ISO standard 8601, but it could also be some other type of date standardization that you might want to use here. Next slide, please. There also is a concept of elements within elements. And there are essentially kind of two different ways how this can happen in XML. There's one very structured way where essentially you have a parent element and then you have ch ch children elements. And in these children elements, you will find the actual piece of information that is being encoded. The other possibility is that you might have so-called inline tagging or mixed content where the parent element in itself can also contain text and then child elements are only used to highlight specific part of these texts. So the example that I put here is essentially kind of a longer sentence that you might have. And then within that sentence, you want to kind of highlight one thing as being a link to an external resource. So that just kind of to give you a little bit of an idea of how the XML can be structured. Next slide, please. And that brings me to the actual topic of today, uh, EAD, the encoded archival description. Um, if we go to the next slide, I just wanted to give you a brief um, overview of how EAD came into place. Um, as I mentioned earlier, EAD is very closely aligned to IZG. So essentially you will find the same principles and practices reflected in EAD that I mentioned earlier. So the description from the general to the specific information being shown on the level where it is relevant for um, non-repetition of information and also the linking of descriptions. Next slide, please. There also is something that we call a crosswalk from IZG to EAD. So if you're starting out and already have a little bit of an, a knowledge about IZG, you might want to have a look at this crosswalk. In this case, it's the crosswalk uh, towards EAD3, which we were talking about today. And that already gives you a little bit of an indication of where specific pieces of information from IZG should ideally be encoded when using EAD. Next slide, please. The history of EAD is relatively in parallel to the history of ISAG, although it actually also started a little bit earlier in terms of the publication dates. So in the 1990s, the first version of EAD was developed, and then 1998, it was officially adopted as a standard by SAA. Uh, so that's essentially ED version one uh, from 1998. Um, the kind of more prominent version, which you might be knowing, uh, is ED 2002, which was um, released four years after that very first version. And that was essentially kind of the first version that also addressed international comments. Uh, so ED one is very much based on uh, an Anglo-American approach to archival description. Um, and then the latest version, AD3, uh, was published in 2015. Um, and that essentially kind of um, 
was the result of a major revision. So it included a greater conceptual and semantic consistency of EAD, and it explored some mechanism to um, work more seamlessly and effectively with EAD and other related standards. Next slide, please. So starting with the general structure of EAD, if we go to the next slide, um, and this is essentially kind of a, a visualization that I will use throughout the, the next few slides, um, and then you will see um, consistently throughout the, the remainder of the presentation, because essentially when we are talking about EAD or XML, you can think of it like boxes and boxes and boxes or kind of Russian dolls. So uh, a little doll and a bigger doll and a bigger doll and a bigger doll. Um, and that maybe makes it a little bit easier to kind of co compartmentalize uh, where specific pieces of information go. And essentially the main structure of EAD consists of two main elements and that is the control section and the archival description section or ArchDesk. We go to the next slide, please. Um, I just wanted to mention a few words on the EAD element itself, because that is also a central part of the standard. So this is the very first element that you will have to put into an EAD XML document, because with this element, you essentially kind of signify that this XML document is following the EAD um, standard. Uh, so you will have kind of what we call a namespace declaration in there. Um, and you will have information about where the schema is located. So uh, that helps you in, in processes later on to actually validate that the EAD that you are creating is conform to the EAD standard, how it has been defined. Usually when you export your EAD, all of that information will already kind of automatically be included from your collection management system. Um, similarly, if you create uh, EAD in, XM, in an XML editor, that XML editor will have a possibility where you can just kind of point to the schema and then the editor will automatically create the technical um, interpretation of that. Um, and last, if you are using EAD as a result of a transformation, uh, for example, from an Excel spreadsheet, the transformation script will usually take care of these technical details. So I'm just mentioning them because they are important, but usually you don't necessarily have to kind of uh, think about them because they will have been predefined in other contexts. Next slide, please. The control element, that's the next section, is for any administrative information about the EAD XML document itself. So it is not about the materials that you're describing, but it, for example, is about who created the EAD XML document and when and how it was created. So it might include an information that this is an export from system ABC. Um, you might also find information about versions of or changes to the EAD XML document within control. Um, and control gives you the possibility to include any rules and conventions that are applied to the EAD XML document. So essentially, this is an equivalent to the notes and the description control areas of ISAG. Next slide, please. And then the, the other part of EAD, the Archdesk section, archival description section, is essentially where all the information goes about the materials themselves, about the relationships between the materials and other entities like the records creators. Uh, and that includes everything from the very highest level of archival description, like the forms of the collection, to the lower level of descriptions, uh, like the files or items. Next slide, please. Looking closer at the Archdesk element, we can again kind of identify three distinct subsections of that. If you go to the next slide, please. And the first work, um, one of these is the 
descriptive identification area. Um, and that is essentially the identity statement of ISAG. So that's why the name is relatively similar, even though we are using uh, one of these uh, much loved abbreviations. So uh, if you're talking about ED, you often will hear the DIT element rather than the descriptive information element. Um, and it also includes a few pieces of information from the context area of ISAG. So that includes the unit of descriptions identifier, the title, the dates, the physical description, but it also includes things like the language of material, for example, or the name of the records creator and the holding institution. Next slide, please. The next part within Archdesk is what we call narrative elements. And that is essentially providing you with the possibility to include additional information about the context of the materials being described. So that is the context, the content and structure area, but also the conditions of access and use and the allied material areas of ISAG. Um, next slide, please. And the last element is the so-called DSC element, which stands for description of subcomponents. Uh, and that essentially you're starting uh, point for a multi-level description. So um, you might have the Archdesk element on its own um, when you're only describing the collection of fonts or when that is the information that you currently have available. But you can then also kind of extend that with adding the DSC element and thereby kind of starting a more detailed description of the the pieces and parts that make up the fonts and collection. Next slide, please. And essentially here is where the actual box in box in box principle becomes more obvious. So the DSC element includes something that is called the component element uh, or simply abbreviated to C. Um, and you can have a C element, for example, for a subfonts or for a bigger series within your fonts or collection. Uh, you can have a C element then that is then broken down into different files. And the file C elements might again be broken down into smaller C elements that represent the items within your collection description. And you can see from, from this example here that not each of these breakdowns needs to be done in the very same way, but it very much depends, of course, on how your fonts or collection is structured. So the first row that you see here is very identical in each of its parts. Um, it is breaking down in one subject section and then in one other, um, while the next row is only kind of having two steps, so to say. So there is the, the, the series level, and then there is directly, for example, the item level of description. And then the third row shows that there might also be a mix. So there might be a series level where some of the files break down into items while others don't. So that very much depends on the material that you're describing. And EAD gives you the flexibility to structure that in the way that it matches your materials. Next slide, please. And this is just kind of to show you how this would look like if you were looking directly at the EAD XML. And in bold, you can see the actually mandatory elements in this description. And you from this, you can already see that what I mentioned earlier, the DSC part, the description of subcomponents, is not a requirement when you're using ED. So you can also use ED if you're simply describing the collection as a starting point. Next slide, please. Any questions up to this point before we have a closer look at the different parts of the description? That 
doesn't seem to be the case at the moment. So we're gonna move on to the next slide, please. And we're first gonna have a look at the control section in a little bit more of a detail. Uh, next slide. So the ED standard in itself only descri prescribes a handful of elements that are actually mandatory for all ED XML documents. And most of these mandatory elements actually sit in the control part. It doesn't sit in the archival description part which seems to be a little bit counterintuitive, but on the other hand, it makes sense because the control part is what allows you to actually kind of control what is in your ED file and how you can exchange it or move it from one place to the other. Next slide, please. Looking at these mandatory elements within control, there are currently five of them. Um, record ID, uh, file desk, maintenance status, maintenance agency, and maintenance history. And we're just gonna have a quick look at what those elements stand for. If we go to the next slide, please. The record ID, as you might have guessed, is a unique identifier of the ED XML document itself. Um, this should at least be unique and ideally persistent within the workflows of the institution that created the ED XML file. Um, so that essentially kind of helps you keep track of which ED XML document represents which type of your fonts or collections. Um, if you had an identifier that isn't unique, um, you might kind of run into the problem where you have uh, two ED XML files with the same identifier, and then you will have to disambiguate them uh, in order to actually work with them. And uh, if they are not persistent, that so essentially if you are creating an identifier each and every time that you are creating the ED file, you will not be able to keep track of versions of the same ED file. So if you're essentially kind of working with the same ED file over a longer time. Um, ideally, of course, those identifiers would actually be globally unique and persistent. So you might want to consider using something like an ARC identifier, an archival resource key, or a DOI, a digital object identifier, or something similar for the record ID uh, in your ED files, because that then also helps you to in the sharing process with, with others. Uh, I also wanted to mention that there is an optional parallel element that is called other record ID. So for example, if you have an identifier that was used in a previous system and you have moved to a new collection management system, you might still want to keep track of that old identifier for referencing reasons. Or if we are thinking about um, an aggregating context, um, it might be that the aggregator assigns a record ID that is unique and persistent within the aggregation context, but still wants to reference the IDs that were used in the original context where the ED files are coming from. Next slide, please. The next mandatory element is called file desk or file description. Um, and that is essentially where all the bibliographic information about your finding aid goes in. Um, and this breaks down into five statements or STMT areas um, as they are abbreviated in file names. Um, and one of them is mandatory and that is the title statement, which at least needs to include the title for the finding aid, um, but also then allows you to encode, for example, the author or a sponsor of the finding aid if you have worked with a, a private body to create the finding aid, for example. Um, and it then also includes additional optional elements where you can, for example, give a publishing um, name or a publishing date. Um, next slide, please. 
The maintenance status is a very short element. Uh, it comes with a set of predefined possible values to choose from and essentially kind of gives you a possibility to indicate um, in a direct way the drafting status or the versioning status of the EED XML document. So there's, for example, a value that says new, or it is there's a value that says revised, uh, if you have kind of updated an existing EED document. And there are also different forms of the status deleted. Um, and that is kind of to help you to keep track of something that you might have removed for various reasons, or it helps you keep track of something that has been merged from two existing um, ED uh, sources originally, uh, or where, for example, one file has been split into several files. Um, so I know from our context, um, various examples where one fonts and collection is very big, um, and where the institution might have started with originally one ED file um, and then broken that down into several ones to make them better handleable. Um, and this would be one of those cases where you might actually kind of see a deleted split status in the maintenance status. Next slide, please. Then there is the maintenance agency, uh, and that is essentially kind of the name of the institution or the service that created, respectively maintained, or is disseminating the EAD XML document. Um, and you can include the name, but you can also include a code or an identifier of that institution or service. Um, I'm mentioning service because it might also be that you are putting the name of the collection management system in there, if that is what has created the EAD XML file. Next slide, please. And then the last mandatory element within control is what is called the maintenance history. Um, and that is essentially where all the versioning happens. So maintenance history can consist of one or more so-called maintenance events. Um, so you will usually have at least one maintenance event that signifies the creation of the EAD XML document. But there might be additional ones uh, where you want to record revisions or updates or other types of changes that have happened throughout the lifetime of the EED document. Um, again, you have a possibility to name the agent responsible for the event, and that might be a person or it might be a machine or, or script. Uh, so for example, if you have uh, run a script that has normalized all the dates um, that you mentioned in your ED file, uh, you might want to kind of mention that script as the agent in a maintenance event. Um, and then you usually should also give uh, the date and type when that event has happened. Um, and there's an optional event description element where you can include some further information about that. Next slide, please. And this is again how this would look like um, in the EAD XML structure. Um, you can see this is only uh, looking at the mandatory elements within control um, and uh, just some example values, so to say, in there, how you can um, include that information. Um, <clears throat> next slide, please. And again, a quick stop to see if there are any questions or comments. I don't see anything in the chat at the moment. So I'll just continue and then hopefully we'll have uh, still time at the end for additional questions. So looking at the archival description and the component elements, um, next slide, please. Uh, I want to start with the statement that uh, there actually are kind of two variations of the component element. Uh, so there is the unnumbered C element, and then there are numbered C elements. So you might also find uh, examples where you have a C01, C02, up to C12 
um, element within the XML structure. Uh, for this presentation, we're going to stick with the unnumbered C elements, but essentially everything that I say for the C unnumbered C element also applies to the numbered ones. And then if we go to the next slide, um, the next statement that I wanted to make is that essentially the Archdesk element and the C element for the archival description element for the highest level um, and the C component elements for anything that comes underneath are essentially set up in the same way. So you will find in both places the descriptive information element, the DIT element that I already mentioned. You will find in both places the narrative elements. And then the only variation is that the Archdesk element has the DSC element that I already mentioned. And then the C element has potentially lower C elements that you can nest within it. So kind of the box in a box idea. Next slide, please. And again, there's only a, a very limited um, kind of requirement in terms of which elements need to be there in both of these contexts. So essentially from the standard and how it has been defined, the only thing that has to be there when you're using either the Archdesk element or one of the C elements is the descriptive identification, so the did element. Um, within that did element, you have 17 sub-elements um, and only one of them has been present, has to be present. Um, and there's no prescription which one it is. So you can either use the uh, identifier element or you can use the title element or you can use the date element or you can use one of the other elements which we'll have a look at uh, in a minute. Um, as long as one of those elements is present, your EAD file will be valid and will be according to how EAD as a standard has been defined. Next slide, please. So how does this exactly look like? Um, and this is again uh, looking specifically at the pieces of information that ISAG has defined as essential. Um, if we go to the next slide, please you will see that both the Archdesk element and the C element uh, come with an attribute called level. Um, and that is essentially where you can include the level of description. So one of the six essential pieces of information. Um, there's a predefined list for doing that. Um, and that comes from fonds or collection as the highest level to item as the lowest level. And there also is a possibility to extend that list with other types of values that you might be using in your local environments. So there's a value called other level. And when you're using that, there's a parallel attribute called other level, which then is open to including any values that you see fit in your context. Next slide, please. The next element within DIT is the unit ID. Uh, so that's a unique identifier for the materials being described. Um, and this could be an accession number, or it could be a reference code, or it could be some other type of identifier that you're using in your context for this specific unit of description. There's also a possibility to use the attributes country code and repository code um, to create the idea of a global uniqueness in combination with what you have put into unit ID. Or similar to what I mentioned with regard to record ID, you might actually be using persistent identifiers like ARCs or DOIs or similar models um, within the unit ID directly. Next slide, please. The next one is the unit title. So that's the title of the materials being described. And that can be a formal title, um, or it could be a supplied title, uh, which you have just kind of um, continued using from the source of acquisition. Um, and it can be a single word, or it can be a phrase, depending on whatever is most applicable to the unit of description that you're currently describing. Next slide, please. 
For the dates of the described materials, there are two variations how you can encode them in EAD3. Um, both of them allow you to include uh, either text or numbers, um, like the 21st of May example that we had earlier. Um, and they also allow you to include um, normalized dates in both cases. They also allow you in both cases to encode either a single date, the date range or a combination of both. The main difference between unit date and unit date structured is that structured part. So essentially unit date is just one element where you can include the text um, uh, and textual information of the date, however you want to formalize that. While unit date structure breaks down into child elements, um, date single, date range, or date set, uh, which then allows you to kind of give a more structured information on the dates of creation or copyrighted or issued or broadcast. So that might be something that if you are using an export from um, a collection management system, where usually the information is held in a more structured way, is how that system exports the unit date information. Um, otherwise, as I said, essentially you can do the same things with both of these approaches. Next slide, please. The Next three elements um, are kind of similar to what I just said to unit date and unit date structured. Um, all three of them are meant to encode some statement of physical characteristics of the described materials. So that might be their extent, their dimension, um, it might be some terms describing their genre or form. Um, it might be information about their appearance. So if you want to give information about a specific style or technique or method of creation, uh, you would usually kind of use one of these three elements. Um, and essentially, FIST desk and FIST desk structured um, have the same pairing as unit date and unit date structured. So FIST desk allows you to kind of just include text in the element itself, while FIST desk structured um, has some sub elements and child elements where you can include the information. And then the third one, FIST desk set, allows you to group several FIST desk, stru FIST desk structured statements. Um, so that is, for example, the useful if you are describing um, the bigger unit of description, like a collection, um, and that has a mix of materials, and you wanted to kind of indicate that part of your collection is of material one, and another part is of material two. But as they both refer to the same collection as a whole, you might want to group them in a fist desk set element. Next slide, please. And then the last uh, of the six essential pieces of information is the name of the person, the organization or the family responsible for usually the creation of the materials, but it might also be, depending on the context, the accumulation or assembly of the described materials. Um, and that in EAD is done with an element called origination. Um, and origination, has sub elements that allow you to indicate uh, which type of agent you are gonna name. So if you are gonna use a person name, that is for a person, corp name is for an organization, fem name is for a family. Next slide, please. So that is the first part of the Artdesk and the DIT element. Um, and now we're gonna have a quick look at how the second part looks like, the narrative elements, just to give you a little bit of an idea of what type of information you can have in that section. Next slide, please. So just to say that upfront, all of these narrative elements are optional. Um, so you can use them, but you don't have to use them if you're encoding in EAD. Um, essentially, as I've already mentioned, um, they are covering um, 
four of the main areas of ISOG, context, content and structure, access and reuse and allied materials. Um, and you will find kind of element names in those uh, groups that usually speak for themselves. So you will have something like a biochis, which is a biography or history note. You will have a scope content, which refers to the scope and the content of the material. You will have an element called access restrict, which describes the conditions of access. Or you will have an element called related materials, which describes allied materials um, that people might want to look at if you are interested in the piece of material that they are currently looking at. All of these elements can be structured, uh, so they have a possibility to include some text formatting elements, um, which might either be just uh, several paragraphs, uh, or you might also kind of include lists or tables in there. Next slide, please. Um, and I wanted to highlight uh, two of these narrative elements separately because they are of importance specifically when we look at exchanging material. One of them is the element that is called controlled access. Um, and that is essentially where you can include terms or names from controlled vocabularies. Um, so uh, this might be names of agents with corp name, fam name, person name that are already mentioned for also the name of the creator. It might be names of places with the element geog names. It might be topics or themes with the element subject. Um, and essentially all of these elements allow you to kind of point out to um, authority files, uh, to um, vocabularies, to thesauri, uh, like for example, the Library of Congress subject headings or something like geonames or something like the Jetty Art um, Architecture um, Thesaurus, uh, Jetty AAT, um, and that will make it easier if you start exchanging or sharing your data for others to pick up on these links to controlled vocabularies. Specifically, if we are talking about an international exchange uh, where we might want to bridge different languages or different writing systems. Um, so having those links to these national or international vocabularies will support those international exchanges. Next slide, please. And then this is just uh, an example of how the ED could look like, um, concentrating on the C element, um, but essentially you might find a similar structure if you are looking at the Archdesk element. Um, and this is an export from, from archive space. Um, and you can see how this would be structured, um, how they have sorted the six elements that I mentioned earlier. You can see that they are using actually both unit date structured and unit date um, next to each other. Um, and at the bottom, you can also see an element that I didn't specifically mention, but which is important if you have digitized material or born digital material. Um, and that is the DAO element, the digital archival object, which allows you to essentially kind of link out to that digital representation um, and to kind of also give information about whether that image is shown directly within the page where you're showing the archival description or if it is linking out to a viewer uh, which might have additional functionality like a zoom in, zoom out. Next slide, please. This is an example from Atom and you can see that it is similar yet different uh, to how uh, archive space does it uh, and that just kind of is an indication of the flexibility of um, ead so uh, neither one is is uh, is wrong uh, both of them are similarly valid um, and um, so you can just kind of see how different approaches 
um, might result in a slightly different representation in EAD. Next slide, please. And then this last one is just kind of picking up on the example that we had earlier from an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and you will find a similar structure here. Um, so um, it is maybe a little bit uh, more constrained uh, because the Excel structure um, already kind of gives you uh, a formatting um, that isn't necessarily present when you're look in, looking at um, a web interface or, or a system interface uh, where there might be different things happening behind the screen. Um, but essentially, it kind of it gives you a similar structure here as well. Um, next slide, please. And just kind of to pick up on the one question that I uh, just received directly. Um, yes, we will be sharing um, the PowerPoints um, in essentially all four languages that we have prepared them. Next slide. Um, and at the, the end of, of this session, I just wanted to um, give you a few examples with regard to um, how you can create, how you can publish, how you can share EAD documents, just to kind of bring all this, this back into the, the real world. And we're gonna start with creating EAD uh, documents, how this will look like on the next slide. Um, so one example could be exporting EAD from a collection management system. And to be honest, this is probably how most colleagues around the world are using EAD as an export. Um, so collection management systems like the two that I mentioned already, uh, which by the way are open source um, systems, which is why we are usually using them for our examples here. Um, will include different options to export the data. And if they are specifically meant for archival material, they might also include a specific export either in EAD3 or into its predecessor version ED2002. Um, and as I mentioned, this is not only important for sharing data externally, but also if you want to migrate your data from an old system into a new system. Uh, most of these exports will be predefined by the system, but there also are systems around where you have a little bit of customization possibilities. Um, and that might also include options where essentially specific pieces of information are not necessarily kind of part of what you put into the collection management system when describing the information, but you will add information like, for example, the identifier of the DXML file itself upon export. Next slide, please. Um, this is just how this would look like in archive space. Uh, you can see um, that's essentially kind of the back end view. There's a possibility to export and then there are different possibilities um, that archive space supports. Um, and you can see with the checkboxes, there are different options how you can essentially kind of customize your export. Um, and the third one here also picks up on the difference between numbered and unnumbered C elements that I mentioned earlier. Next slide, please. This is an example from Atom. Um, and you can see the options here are less. Uh, you have essentially kind of two export possibilities, either in EED 2002 in this context. Uh, or into Dublin Core, which is also an XML standard and one standard that might be used um, more in kind of across domain context. So specifically, if you're exchanging data with libraries or with museums, um, Dublin Core might be more straightforward in that context. And then if you go to the next slide, um, this is essentially kind of the, the third example that we have used throughout this presentation is when you're transforming data in other formats to EAD. So you might not have a collection management system um, or your collection management system doesn't support EAD, but it, it for example, exp uh, exports into something like a comma separated value. 
uh, list. Um, and this might be something that you could be working with. So if you go to the next slide, please. This is how this could look like. So um, from the uh, Excel file that we saw earlier, um, there might be kind of a transformation script that was created by your ICT department and that picks up usually on the column names. Um, so that's why the column names are important in such a, a template Excel file. Um, and based on the, on the column names uh, that will create the ERD version of the data. Next slide, please. And then the last option, of course, uh, is hand coding. So uh, it might also be that you are actually using, using an XML editor, uh, such as the free tool Notepad++ or commercial products like Oxygen or Dreamweaver to actually create ERD XML files from scratch. Or what we have also heard from colleagues is that they might be using uh, an XML editor in addition to kind of um, customize the XML exports that they have created from collection management systems. So thinking back of the example that we saw earlier from um, archive space, it might be that you are actually kind of going into the XML file directly and are removing either the unit date structured or the unit date option if you are only using one of them in your actual context. Next slide, please. And this is how, how hand coding, for example, in Oxygen could look like. Uh, so usually the XML editors would support a possibility for you to, while creating your XML file, uh, also specifying the XML standard, in this case EAD, that you want to create the, the file towards to, and that usually kind of um, presents you with an empty EAD XML file that you then can start filling in. Um, next slide, please. And essentially how this will look like is that your um, XML editor has learned the, the schema, the, 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 the standard definition, uh, when you have kind of pointed to the schema at the creation of your XML file. And that means that it kind of presents you with options uh, as you move along through your file. So uh, in this case, I'm, I'm in the Archdesk element in, in DIT. Um, I've already created my identifier, but then I'm gonna start adding some more information and the Oxygen XML editor presents me with some options for, of elements that I can choose from. Next slide, please. Uh, publishing EED documents can also um, look very different depending on your context. And I've just chosen a few examples to show that to you. If we go to the next slide, please. Um, this is how, for example, um, Atom um, shows the materials that have been uh, created in it. So um, Atom comes with a publication platform um, and it looks very similar to, to what you ha would have seen uh, while you are creating the information. So you have a hierarchy at the top and then you've got kind of the possibility uh, to see the more details for each descriptive unit. Uh, next slide, please. And this is how this might look like in the Library of Congress. So um, you start with a search result uh, where you have a summary or scope content note um, of the collection. And if we go to the next slide, please. Um, this is essentially kind of the, the finding aid view uh, where you start with a collection summary, but then can go into the different sections uh, like, for example, the contents list where you have all the pieces of information for each and every component uh, within this collection. Next slide, please. Um, and this is how this might look like. Uh, and you can see in this example, there's also digital content available. Next slide. And this leads you to an image viewer essentially that allows you to kind of zoom in, zoom out um, and um, do a little bit more with the digital content. Um, and I think we're gonna just 
jump over a few slides uh, to just kind of go to the aggregation part. Um, just in the interest of time. Uh, so sharing ED documents, um, how this could look like, um, and just kind of looking at the, the first example that I have on the next slide here. Um, that is uh, a regional or statewide aggregation, in this case, the, the online archive of California. Um, and you can find that their initial display is relatively similar to um, an institution website, how this might be uh, shown. Uh, so you have a description of the collection, you have extended information, uh, you have at the very top the title and the identifier. Um, and I'm specifically have chosen this example to just also show you a little bit of a mix of um, material, so to say, or, or, or media. Um, how this can be presented. So in this case, essentially, the more detailed information has been put into a PDF document. Um, and this is what you can reach uh, when you click at the very bottom, um, the additional content information from this. Um, and I think as we just have, um, no, actually, we have, we have half an hour left. Um, sorry, I was on the wrong time. So we can go into, into the more details. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is just a method, other example um, that's from the United Kingdom um, Archives Hub. Uh, it's a national aggregator. Um, and you can see that they are starting out with essentially kind of a map display. So they are starting out on the level of um, the providing institutions um, and on the level of collections. And then if you go to the next slide, please, um, they allow you to enter the finding aid view as we have seen it also in other examples. Um, so in this case, you have um, the collection level description here. Uh, you also see that they have an XML button here. So um, you could download the EAD, how they have created it in their backend. Um, and on the right, you can see the um, hierarchy of this collection and you can essentially kind of navigate via that hierarchy to the different subparts of the collection. Next slide, please. This is an example just from the other side of the globe. Uh, so that's Trove from Australia also a national aggregator, but um, essentially kind of a cross domain aggregator. So it's not only including material from archives, but also mainly libraries and I think a few museums. Um, and they start out with a search, but uh, when you have found something of interest and click on the title, uh, if we go to the next slide, um, we'll see something very similar to what we have seen in other presentations. Um, so you will have the detailed information uh, of the unit of description on the right in this case, and on the left, you will have the hierarchical structure um, that provides you access to the item descriptions. Um, and if we go to the next slide, please, um, this is how the item description with, in this case, digitized material might look like. So. They have set this up kind of in an overlay uh, where you can open the digitized material um, on top, so to say, of the item level description. Um, and you can essentially kind of click into each of the images to see them in more detail. Next slide, please. And this is the, the last example, uh, so kind of from regional, statewide, international, uh, to national and international aggregation. Um, this is Archives Portal Europe, uh, where we currently have more than 30 countries uh, represented. Um, and essentially, uh, we would also start you off with um, a search. And you can see on the left-hand side, there are different filters that you can then apply to your search results. Uh, so for example, you can focus on everything that has been provided in this case from the United Kingdom. Uh, and then if you start looking at the examples, if you go to the next slide, please, uh, you will also in our context see 
a similar setup like you've seen in the other cases. So um, the main presentation, uh, main information of the descriptive unit presented on the right uh, and on the left having a small navigation of the hierarchy where you can then kind of scroll through and browse to um, other parts of the collection that might be of interest. Um, and we also have uh, a digital objects um, part and essentially with this we are linking out to um, the original provider, so to the archival institution, um, and that gives you the possibility to then kind of potentially use any other functions that the archival institution might be supporting on their own website like Zooms um, or, um, for example, a download of the digital object, uh, if that is applicable. And I think that brings us to an end of the presentation. I'm sorry that I rushed through that at the end. I was completely at, at, uh, at a different ending time for our um, webinar, but we still have uh, nearly half an hour left um, for any questions, comments, or thoughts. I will stop the screen sharing now, so it's easier to see you. It's okay for all the others to also stop the screen sharing. Yeah, and I have one first question in the chat, which I'm just gonna read out loud. Um, I have a few AD2002 files exported from Atom. Three or four years ago, I tried to import these files into Archive Space. As you showed in your presentation, the ADs in Atom and Archive Space are written differently. I couldn't use the import feature because AD2002 and AD3 are incompatible and I can't code by hand. Please let me know if there's a simple tool that I can use to convert ED2002 files exported from Atom to ED3. Um, so yes, uh, first of all, um, the, the main difference here is that indeed ED2002 and e, uh, Atom and um, Archive Space uh, are using two different versions of ED. And as they are two different major versions, they are not what we call backwards compatible. So something that is in AD2002 might not in all cases also be there in AD3. Kirsten, sorry, can yes. I inter interrupt you a bit? Um, it looks like um, participants are changing um, caption. So like participants are changing the languages of the captions. So, yeah. Yeah. Can you um, remind people not to change it? <laughs> and because it will help for me to interpret, to see the yes. script. Yeah. Yes, thank sure, you, sure. thank you. Yeah, so um, I don't know how, what is it set to right now. I hope it's set back to English. So it's not at the moment, I'm gonna do this. So I'm gonna do set the captions back to English and please remind everyone to, leave it uh, with English. Um, unfortunately, captions, um, contrary to the interpretation, can only be set up for one language for everyone. So essentially, every time you change it to your language, this will change for everyone. And probably English in this context is still um, the closest um, denominator between us. Um, so we'd appreciate if you could leave it with English. Thank you very much. Ah, question, sorry. Is yep. the interpretation function on? The I interpretation see the... function should be on, yes. Is it on, Amy? No, I don't think so. Yeah, um... it has been turned off, it seems. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry, everyone, I'm just going to start this again. 
Okay, now it should be available. Okay, um, good. Going back to the question. So yes, um, Archive Space uses ED3 and Atom uses ED2002. Um, and as I mentioned, both are slightly different to each other. Um, so that's why an export from Atom uh, in ED2002 will not easily be imported in um, Archive Space, which is using ED3. Um, we do have, yes, Amy. Yes. Okay. So Atom and Archive Space use two different versions of EAD. Which is why you cannot directly use an export from Atom in Archive Space. Uh, but I'm going to put a link into the chat where we have a conversion from EAD 2002 to EAD 3, which you can use to hopefully help you with that. Okay. Then I'm just going to look at the chat. There's one more question um, about the crosswalk between IZG G and EAD. Um, and I'm just going to look this up in the tag library, just a second. So again, putting a link into the chat. And that link brings you directly to the crosswalk that has been established between either G and EAD. And essentially what this crosswalk does is that it puts the um, elements that are mentioned in IZG next to elements that you can use to encode the same information in EAD. So this crosswalk is something that you could use when you start out with defining how you want to use EAD in your context. especially when you are coming from an either G based approach for your archival descriptions. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. There is one more question in the chat. Uh, and that is, will the emergence of RIC records in context affect the future of ED and how it is used? And um, this is something that brings me back to what I said at the beginning, that we are currently in a major revision of EAD. And in this major revision, um, we also have looked at records in context, which just has been released end of last year by the ICA. And I would say there is probably one major change that we uh, want to introduce with the next version of EAD that is based on records and context. And that is essentially looking at the entity-based approach that records and context brings. Records and context looks at the records, but it also looks in, in kind of the at the same level um, at entities like the agents that have created the records or the functions that I mentioned earlier. And we are planning to replicate that to a certain extent in the new version of EAD, which will have kind of elevated elements for these entities. So for example, we will introduce Okay, so we will introduce uh, a new um, element that is called agents very generally, um, and that will allow us to not only include the records creator, but also any other type of agent that is important for the records that we are describing. And we will have a similar approach for entities like places or functions. And we will integrate some of the existing elements to create something that replicates the idea of instantiations in records and context.
-hmm. And instantiation is something that is a different presentation version of a record. So for example, a digitized version or maybe a copy that another institution has. I hope that answers the question on Rick uh, without going into too much detail right now. Okay. See one more question in the chat at the moment, and that is, uh, could you tell me why we need to make FISDesk to be structured? Um, I will say that that is a good question. Um, <laughs> and I would say um, you don't have to, let's put it like this. Uh, ED just gives you the possibility to do it if needed. Okay. I think that's all the questions that I could see in the chat so far. So thank you, Note. Thanks very much. Um, will TSES create the crosswalk table between ED and ESC vocabularies and Rick Oak vocabularies? So um, again, a question on records and context. Um, and I can say that TSES is in conversation with the expert group on archival descriptions, which has created records and contexts. And as part of this, we will look into uh, a potential crosswalk between EAD, EAC, EF, and records and context, but we don't have any details about how this will look like so far. Okay. Just scrolling through the chat ones more to see that we haven't forgotten anything. We've done this one. Okay. Don't see any more questions at the moment. I'm just giving everyone a little additional time to maybe think about if there's anything else they want to know. Just checking with our colleagues from China and Japan specifically, have you received any questions in your languages that we should be taking? No, okay. 
And I can think we can wrap this up for today. Thank you very much, everyone, for your attendance, uh, for your questions. Thank you very much to everyone for the translations of the slides and for the interpretation right now of the questions. Um, as said, we will be sharing the slides um, and we'll be sharing the recording once it is available. Uh, it will also be interesting for us to see how the recording will turn out uh, because this was the first time that we A, used sharing multiple slides at the same time and having multiple channels now for the conversation. Um, so we will, yeah, <laughs> see, see how the how the recording turns out and then keep you posted about that. So thank you very much again, and I wish all of you a nice evening. And thank you, Karsten, for giving us this presentation. You're welcome. So I will stop the recording now. Thank you very much.